Okay, hi guys, this is Christy Hendricks from Change of Shift, and I have another really a great interview for you today. Today we're gonna to be talking with Sarah Mott, and Sarah is a registered nurse, and she is she's the nurse behind uh, Nurse Born Products. So if you've ever thought about bringing a physical product to market, you wanna stick around for this interview. Uh, because Sarah's got all those answers. She's done it, been there, done that. She's the expert on it. She's going to kind of give you some tips and, and helps to get you on your way so that you can kind of, you know, uh, get started with that on your own. Okay, so Sarah is a registered nurse. And like I said, she's the founder of Nurse Born Products and the creator of a patented Nurse Born stethoscope holder called the Koala Clip. Really, really clever little thing. We'll take a look at it in just a few minutes. Um, and then uh, Sarah's website, her nursebarn.com, was created as a place to find quality, useful, and interesting products that were inspired by nurses. But it's also a place to go for inspiration and motivation and encouragement <clears throat> through your journey as a nurse and a nurse entrepreneur. So excuse me for my rough voice right now. I think I'm getting a cold. But anyway, I would like to introduce for you uh, Sarah Mott. Hi guys, nice to meet you. It's so nice to have you with us. Hi, I'm so excited. I'm like giddy. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so, okay. So what I'd like to start out as um, is I really want to give our, our viewers an idea of what was your, what was your career background like before you started Nurse Born Products? What were you doing? Well, I started as a CNA working at a an acute care rehab hospital. And once I became a nurse, I, a not registered nurse, I stayed at that rehab hospital where I worked with spinal cord injury patients, traumatic brain injury, um, all kinds of rare diseases and patients with wounds to the bone. It was a very complex and um, dynamic area of nursing and I absolutely loved it. And I'd say about six years, I started to get burnt out because the patient load was really heavy. And, and just the type of patients we had, a lot of them were bedridden and couldn't move on their own. They were really heavy. So I needed a change. And I left the rehab hospital and went to post-op surgical. And I also love that position. And while working on the surgical unit, I ended up on a leave of absence and um, was never able to return um, due to a chronic illness that I acquired. And I did try out a little bit of home care there, here and there. And um, eventually I found myself in, in business for myself. It was kind of an accident. <laughs> okay, I've heard that actually from some other nurses, how you, you know, sometimes accidentally fall into something. Mm -hmm. um, but that can be really fortuitous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was certainly in your case. It <clears throat> was. So um, what happened for me is while I was working, I did not like to wear my stethoscope around my neck. Um, for many reasons, because I didn't like how it felt. It weighed my neck muscles and, um, you know, I felt like it was pulling my neck muscles forward and causing headaches and discomfort. I didn't like the germs near my face. And um, plus the danger of patients coming, um, you know, an agitated patient jumping up and, and grabbing your stethoscope, especially if you're working with patients who are traumatic brain injury or detoxing or that type of patient. And so I tried to find a product that would let me hold my stethoscope on my, um, the, the waistband of my scrubs. And I, I did find a product, but it didn't work. I couldn't find another product. And I had an idea in my head of what I wanted, but it didn't exist. And I remember working and thinking, I wish somebody would invent this. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was on a leave of absence that I started to think about it again and um, then eventually developed my product. And um, it was through the development, the process of developing the product, which I, 
Um, and, you know, I don't even think I thought about starting a business. It just kind of happened. Just accidentally. You were just yeah. thinking, oh, okay, so I really, I wish somebody would, you know, I wish somebody would like create this product. And you started to pursue that, not even thinking that it would be like a route to get out of clinical nursing and then into your own business. No, no. And it worked out for me because I wasn't able to go back to clinical nursing. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it allows me to stay connected with other nurses, um, nurses who are in business, as well as nurses who are working on the floor. Uh, it's allowed me to um, connect with student nurses and um, all kinds of people. So do you now, do you have a sample of that that you can show us? I do. Yay. So it comes in um, several colors. And so um, this is the package. Um, the can you hold that up a little bit higher? Can you see it? Uh, okay. Yes. So I'm going to show you. So this, it's going to be hard to demonstrate it. But, um, so the Koala Clip, can you see it? Yep. It has a spring in the back. So what you would do is you would um, clip this part to either your scrub pocket, the back part to your scrub packet, or your waistband, or maybe a tote bag. And then this part opens by spring. And the way it works is, let's see if I could do it without it being on my clothes. So you take your stethoscope and you just clip it in and and it so this would be on your script, you know, attached to your clothing and it would hold your stethoscope like so. Okay, so you could put it like in your top pocket right yeah, here. You could put it you could put it anywhere. I, can you see that? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that. Okay. So too, um too loose. So now, do you have, you have other, oh, and you know what, let me actually maybe share, let me see if I can share your website too. Let me just see. Nope, I think maybe not. Oh, anywhere. <clears throat> I think I'll probably share it so we can see. Oh, here you are. Yeah, I have a diagram of the, the one, two, three steps that, that would be easier. Okay, let's just see. I think I've got it now. Oh, yeah, here. Okay, so we'll take a look so we can see that. Okay, so hopefully you can see, uh, hopefully everybody can see your website here, Nurseborn Yeah, Product. I can see it. <clears throat> okay, and you can see here it's at nurseborn.com. Mm -hmm. And if we scroll right down here, yeah, here's that little one, two, three. Yes. That you can see how you can put it on your waistband pocket in a couple of different ways, it looks like. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it fits almost every stethoscope brand and style. Um, you might have to adjust the way you insert it into the chamber, but it, it, it does fit most stethoscopes. The only, I'm not sure about the electronic stethoscopes. Okay, well, I guess those are after my time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, kind of um, a different now shape. Yeah, now I'm showing how long I've yeah. been out of clinical. I also wanted to, now did you create this product here, you, uh, the Cherry Pits Moist? Yes. Pad? Okay, so let me, so, so people can see that there's that product, but you have that to share with us, right, to show us? Um, I don't, um, but let me tell you about that. Okay. So I didn't develop the idea of a cherry pit heating pad, mm -hmm. but um, I do make those cherry pit heating pads because the reason that I have them on my website and that I make them is because when I was first out of work and had a lot of neck pain, I couldn't find a heating pad that I liked that was comfortable. And then I came across these cherry pit heating pads. And um, the idea with the cherry pits is, um, they retain the heat much longer than, than rice or flaxseed or some of the other components that they use to make a heating pad. Mm -hmm. And it's also like these little beads and it, they just kind of like mold to your body and it's so warm and comforting and I just loved it. And I thought every nurse should have a cherry pit heating. 
<laughs> okay. I, you know, I probably, I would tend to agree. Okay. So now what I really would like to, you know, we talked about like how, you know, what your background was and then how you eventually ended up getting into producing, uh, producing these uh, physical products. Um, so what would you say now I've got nurses that are going, well, I have an idea for a product. I've got an invention or I have an idea for something. And she's like, how do I bring that to market? You know, can you kind of shed some light on that? Yes. So you need to get, you have to go from idea to prototype. And that's that, you know, it, it doesn't have to be compli complicated. I guess it depends on the product, but I used household products to make my first prototype. I just, I used duct tape and, and things that I found around the house. Um, it doesn't have to be, your prototype doesn't have to be anything, um, you know, it doesn't have to look good or anything. It just has to be like a general model of what your product is going to be. Mm -hmm. And once you have your prototype, uh, you know, and what's very important is that you get yourself a non-disclosure agreement. So anybody that you share your idea with, you, you need to have them sign that agreement. And if they're offended, then move on to another person. Um, because it's, you, you want to make sure that if you have a great idea, you don't want someone stealing it. And people, people will steal your idea because. Oh, okay. Um, so what, what do you mean by if they're funded? What do you mean offended, by offended? Yeah. Um, so did I say funded? Offended. Oh, if they're offended. Yeah. Oh, by yeah. having to sign a non-disclosure. Yes. Oh, and, okay. Okay. And gotcha. I ran into that, you know, where people didn't want to sign it. And it's just an agreement saying that you're not going to tell anybody about my idea or my product. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so let me back up because I want to take these little baby steps by baby steps yeah. because I don't know any of this and I really want to learn it. And so okay. if I don't know it, I want to make sure that our listeners um, and our, our viewers can can follow okay. along. So where would you find a disclosure statement? Where would you first find that? You can Google one online and, okay. and modify it to your specific needs. Okay. It doesn't have to be through a leak, anybody leak, like a, an attorney or anything. You can create your own agreement. Okay. So you yeah. have, okay. So you have your disclosure, non-disclosure, I guess I should say you've got your non-disclosure form and you've got your prototype that you just kind of jerry rigged together because yeah. it's just a prototype. It's obviously not a finished product. Okay. So I have my disclosure, non-disclosure. And now what do I do? Okay. So you need to find an engineer. Um, and that sounds scary. Yeah, and you're scaring me already, Sarah. How to, <laughs> it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing this. So for me, I happen to have a friend who is an engineer, so he helped me. Um, and so with the engine, first of all, you need the engineer because he needs to make the drawings for your prototype because you need um, specialized drawings. So that when you eventually go to manufacture, they have all the specifications for your product and they can manufacture it correctly. Okay. So, what, what kind of an engineer would, would so, be doing this for? Would it be a mechanical um, engineer? I'm sorry? What kind of an engineer would it be? So, um, so a... Um, Is it a mechanical engineer? Well, you know, it depends on your product. So if it's a mechanical pro, you know, if it's something that involves um, mechanics, you would probably need a mechanical engineer or um, you can, you can often call manufacturers and they often have an engineer on staff who can help you. And a lot of times this is a really good way to go because the manufacturer may want your business and they may want to produce your product. So they will help you um, with the engineering. Okay. Okay. So now that kind of, that is kind of in line with like what I, what research I had done um, when I had like ideas for I don't know, whatever things that I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. And it was like kind of driving you towards the manufacturer first. And you, do you, you kind of seek out manufacturers of say medical devices or things in a, in, in, kind of a similar niche or what? Um, no. 
<laughs> Shows you what I know. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, there's such a, a wide range of products. Maybe if it's a, a product that you're going to use directly on a patient where you need to get FDA approval and have all kinds of testing and that sort of thing, you may want to go to a manufacturer who expert who has expertise in that area. And then um, I think, you know, a manufacturer who works with other medical devices would be very important. However, if you're making something else, something that like my koala clip is for the nurse to use and it's a, a fairly simple product. I um, looked at engineers who worked with plastic because my product's made out of plastic. Okay. And I will give you a tip. So when I first started looking for manufacturers, I Ha, did not have a clue. I didn't know what I was talking about. I didn't know <laughs> I was calling people and I was saying things that didn't make sense because I didn't know what I was talking about. I didn't know what I wanted or what I needed. So I called probably 50 manufacturers and with each call I learned something and by the time I got to the 50th manufacturer I knew exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so where does a nurse find a list of manufacturers? Who, what do you search? So there are, you can either just Google, say you can Google plastic manufacturers or um, scissor manufacturers, or um, you can go to a, rec a resource called thomas.net and it's T-H-O-M-A-S dot net. And you can just type in what kind of manufacturer you want, and it will give you a list of manufacturers. Okay, excellent. And, yeah, and the other resource is manufacturing.com, which is, um, it's just mfg.com. And you can also find manufacturers on that website. Um, and, and that's actually where I found mine. Okay, okay, so that answers a huge question I know for nurses who are looking to, you know, get a, a product manufactured. Okay, so now what would be the next step after, after the nurse has, you know, found a manufacturer? What happens next? Okay, um, so I just want to say really, qu real quick back to the manufacturer is make sure you get at least three or four different quotes because, um, and don't just look at the price like the cheapest manufacturer may not always be the best manufacturer. You may want to go and the, the most expensive may not be the best. Okay. So, so Yeah. Okay. Do you like, do you have tips? Do you, when you contact a manufacturer for your product, then do you have to kind of start right in with negotiations? I mean, are there some things that you should like, do you need to be coy with them? Um, no, I don't think you really need to be coy. Usually what happens is you submit the project, you, you'll you know, tell them what you need, and they will come back with their, um, the cost. And I guess what the important thing is, is, is not that you need to be coy um, and to negotiate and that sort of thing. It's more, um, you want to make sure you're getting really good quality and you want to make sure that the manufacturer is looking at you as a priority. Because when I first started, I ended up with a manufacturer did not feel that I was a priority. So they kept me waiting for my product and waiting for my product. And they told me I wasn't a priority. And so I, I had to move on to someone who felt that my product was just as important as the next person's product. Okay, and, and in that case, had you already given them money? No, I, I um, did not give them any money. At what point would a nurse have to give, pay a manufacturer? Well, each manufacturer will have their own set of um, protocols and how they want to be paid. My manufacturer did not require pay. When you're manufacturing a product, you usually need to have a mold made. And that's the biggest expense of all the expenses. And so my manufacturer did not um, charge me until after the mold was completed. Once the mold was completed, I paid for my mold. 
and um, that becomes my, the, it's located in their facility, but it's my property. So if I wanted to change manufacturers, I could take, I would request that he's, they send my mold to the new manufacturer, it's mine. Okay. So then once I start to need the product, so I, I, say I wanted to order um, 20, 2,500 Koala Clips. Mm -hmm. I would place my order, they would make them, ship them to me, and then I would pay once I received the product. Okay, okay. So, okay. I'm trying to wrap my head around you know, all of this. Am I confusing you? No, it's not, it's not confusing. I'm just trying to, you know, I'm trying to get like the steps in the right order. You know, what yeah. do you do first? Then what do you do? Then what do you do? Then what do you do? Okay, so you have a manufacturer, you know, you, you get bids from several different manufacturers. Um, they make a they make a mold. You have to pay for your mold. Then they make a whole bunch. You just tell you place an order. You tell them how many you want. Yes. They ship them to you, or how do you arrange like shipping and distribution and all that kind of stuff? Okay, so, and I'm speaking from my experience with my manufacturers. So, in my research of manufacturers, they each may have. Um, different ways of doing things. Um, but in general, it, it would, would go along the same line of, of steps. So um, once they make my product, if you're making your product in China, it would have to either come over through air freight, um, which is quite expensive. But if you need your product in a hurry, you would want to use the air freight or ocean freight, which could take up to three months. Oh, wow. That's yeah. a lot of time. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, you have to think about customs because there's all kinds of customs paperwork and documents that need to be filled out when, when you have a product coming from another country. So if you are um, manufacturing overseas, you need to make sure that you have a manufacturer that will take care of those issues for you because they have expertise in that and they know, you know what, what is needed and how to fill out the paperwork. So anyway, once your um, product arrives in the country or um, is completed in the US manufacturer for manufacturing facility, it's just shipped to you from via UPS or Federal Express in big boxes. In big boxes, okay. Yeah. And I mean, luckily you have small products. Yeah. Like, I just wonder what, what would a nurse do if she has a large, a large product, a large invention, she'd have to just have a warehouse where they don't have like shipping, like to made to order, like shipping, like kind of like Amazon does, you know, they wouldn't have made to order, but there are some manufacturers who, who will warehouse the product. And there are also manufacturers who will not only warehouse the product, but ship it to individual um, customers as well. Okay, because I'm, and the reason I'm asking these questions is because, so you've already answered the question about if you have a small product, okay? But I'm thinking like, so I come from a background of NICU. And so I'm thinking, well, what if I had a great idea for a new Isolette? Well, yeah. Isolette, I can't keep those in my garage, right? Yeah. So yeah. what if I had a great idea for that and I had isolettes manufactured? I don't know, like what does that even look yeah. like? So so there are some manufacturers though that can ship directly to the end customer. Yes. Like if you have something yes. that's gonna be shipped to a hospital or something. Yes, yes. So the manufacturer you would um work out a deal with the manufacturer and you know, it might be uh, you know, they charge a small fee. Uh, extra fee to to do the shipping and handling for you okay okay uh, you know there's a lot of um there's also di distribution companies that you can get involved with um who who could distribute your product for you and but you know it, that's a whole whole nother that's another show. <laughs> <laughs> That's another show. Okay, well, maybe you'll be able to give us some um, websites or links or something to those um, that we can post. We'll see. 
Okay, so after manufacturing and then they ship it to you, then what do you do? I mean, still on the back end, you've got your website where you're trying to get pre-sales, mm -hmm. right? Okay, what if it's a product? So your product is direct to nurses. I mean, it's direct to yeah. users. You're a yeah. B2C. A yeah, business, pretty much. Business to customer. Yeah, I have a few accounts. Um, where I sell to um, a few distributors, um, but I, I, I prefer to sell directly to customer and um, versus to the distributors. It just right now, that's where I'm at, and that may change. Okay, so now when you say that you sell direct to the customer, does that mean you're literally selling, sending it direct to the customer via online sales or? Yeah. Could, do you also have a setup for where you contact maybe different um, medical supplies companies or scrub, you know, like scrub stores or something like that, and they carry your product? Yes, both. Okay, so, so how would those, what would those look like? How would that work? Okay, so uh, I'll start with the, the different, the other retailers. So that, then you... So there's two um, ways to sell. You could be a wholesaler in which you're selling your product wholesale to other, to other retailers, or you're a manufacturer and a retailer um, and you're selling direct to customer. So when you're a wholesaler, so there's a lot of things that come into play because when you're pricing your product, you're gonna have a different price for the wholesaler for the wholesale account because you because they need to mark it up so that they can make a profit when they sell it to the end customer. Um, so you have to be prepared with a, a separate price list. And that's a secret list for only people, for only the wholesalers to know. And what you do is basically when you're starting, you just cold call. You pick up the phone and you send emails and you know, what I like to do is to call a company and say, you know, I have this new product. Can I send you an email with more information on it and possibly a sample? And some people will say yes and some will say no. Um, you'll get a lot of no's. But what I found is that those no's sometimes turn into yeses at a later date. Um, sometimes people don't respond to you, they don't get back to you, they don't call you. Um, so you try them again at a later date and they're available at that time. So the, I guess what the most important piece that I'm trying to express is that in this type of business, no is not a firm no. No is for no right now, but it could be a yes later. Um, <laughs> Okay, now let me ask you, let me ask you this because I need clarification. When, like when we're talking about wholesalers and retailers, okay, let me get this straight in my mind and just bear okay. with me. That took me forever to right. get it all straight. Okay, so I understand that if I, I'm the producer of this, I mean, I'm you, I'm the nurse. I have this product made. Now, I understand I can sell it on my website. I get that. That, that makes me the retailer, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay, or I, I can also call different, like scrub shops or whatever that you know, carry these kinds of products, and I could say, hey, I've got this product that's great for nurses. I'm a nurse, I, manuf I made it and all this stuff. How would you like to carry it in your store? In which case then, um, does that make me the wholesaler? Yes. So I'm selling them, selling it to them at a way discounted price. Yes. I still have to make money because I paid my manufacturer. Yes. So, so you're paying, you're charging them a little bit more than your manufacturing cost mm -hmm. because you've got to make a profit, but low enough that it'll be attractive enough to them, you know, cause they're going to make a profit cause then they're going to, they're going to sell it to whoever walks in their shop or in their online store or whatever. Yes. And then also, you want the price, the end price to the customer to be a fair price as well. So w once you set your price, I, the way I work is that I'm terrible with numbers. Mm -hmm. So I do, I might do things a little different than somebody else, but I work backwards. The, yeah. 
Oh. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, that's, I think, what I would do. What's yeah. a fair, start with what's a fair price to the customer. Right. And then step back from there. Yeah. But, but if you do that, though, when you, you would have to have kind of an idea of what the retailer, how much their markup is. How, how much is a typical retail markup? A typical retail markup is 50%. 50%. Okay. Yeah, I so thought it was actually, I actually thought it was much higher than that. Yeah. Like sometimes, sometimes it's higher. Um, but they, you know, if you go with the 50% rule, sometimes it depends on how expensive the product is. So for my product, which is a fairly inexpensive product, it, it would be a 50% markup. But if I was selling something much more expensive, there may be enough room to give the retailer a higher margin, a higher markup. Okay. Okay. So those are just things you need to consider. You have to kind of go, kind of look at between the retailer and what they need to make and what you can sell it to them and your manufacturing costs. Yes. And, and kind of figure something that's going to kind of go in the middle. Okay. Yes. And when you, when you thinking about cost, you know, some one mistake that a lot of new entrepreneurs make is that they think, okay, well, it costs me this much to manufacture my product. Say it costs them a um, dollar to manufacture their product. So I'm going to sell it wholesale $2 and retail $5. But they're not taking into account that they also have to run a business and they have all kinds of um, other things involved in selling that product. I mean, you have advertising, so you need to, you need to figure in advertising costs and you have internet expenses and, and, you know, all kinds of it. Maybe you have employees, you have to pay your employees. So you have to take all of these things into consideration when you're uh, pricing your product. Okay. Okay. Now, so we talked about the retail side. What about like, do you, as nurse inventor, would you sell it to wholesalers? Yes. Okay. How do, what does that look like then? Okay. So I um, do sell to a wholesaler. And so it gets a little tricky here because when you sell to a, so when you sell to a retailer, you might sell a case of 12 items because they're just selling something in their retail store. They don't, they just want, you know, enough to fill their shelves. And so maybe every couple of months they'll buy 12 pieces or 24 pieces, a small amount. But when you're selling to another wholesaler, who's going to then sell it to a, another retailer, mm -hmm. you are, you need, you, you're making your money in quantity more so than in, um, in markup. So I hope I can explain this. So a wholesaler may buy 500 units and you're going to charge them less with, within that quantity. So you're really making less money. So maybe you were making, you were making um, 30% when you sold to the retailer, but now you're only making 20% when you sell to the wholesaler, but you're making your money back in quantity. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That makes sense. And actually, the way I kind of see it too, is if you sell it to a wholesaler, they're able to get it out to so many more, yes, more, so many more retailers than what you can do just on your own. And just by virtue of that, you're getting yourself known. Yes. People are discovering your product. Yes, and that is true. And so you're selling more and even though maybe um, the end dollar amount is a little bit less, you're, you're making more than you would have if you um, were, were not selling to a wholesaler. Okay. Okay. So let me talk for just a minute about, so we talked about wholesalers and retailers and manufacturers and stuff like that. But I now I'm kind of left with the question of like, what about packaging? Who does the packaging? Who Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you know, who does that? <laughs> yeah, so usually the manufacturer does the packaging. Um, if you, if your manufacturer doesn't package or if you elect for your manufacturer not to package it, you can 
you can make your own packaging. Uh, there's packaging um, companies that will package things for you or provide packaging to you. In my case, you know, when I have a great manufacturer and when I first started, he was really, um, really very helpful to me and I didn't have packaging. So he made, he, he just made packaging for me as just, just as a courtesy. Oh, okay. Eventually, so eventually I moved on to my own packaging to a design that I liked better. Um, my website designer designed my packaging and what it is. So my packaging, it's a header card. So this is called a header card, and it's just basically a little header, a card that's attached to a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. My manufacturer puts the product in the bag, ships it to me that way. When I get it, I staple the header card on. So for a small fee, I can send him the header cards and they will staple them on for me. But right now, um, the way we're doing it works. So. Okay, so like that header card. So I can see where you would like design that on on your computer, the mm -hmm. design, and you've got your website and your whatever, all that information and stuff. Where was I going with this? <laughs> <laughs> your header card. Where do you get that little card made? Who makes that little oh, you paper card? Yeah, any print shop can make those cards. I, you can use companies like uh, vistaprint.com Vista where you upload your, your um, design and they'll print the cards for you. Or I think maybe even companies like Staples okay. will do it. Um, you just have to shop around to see who will give you the quality that you want at the price that you want. And usually, you know, they're not too expensive. It, it's usually you know on under 25 cents okay so does the does the the people that do your pack what do you have made for do, okay <laughs> do you have your packaging you know your plastic packaging is that made to accommodate the size of the the card that you have made um my packaging luckily my product fits into a standard size packaging okay so, so they're standard so size custom, plastic bags yeah so it's not custom uh, however if you have a oddly shaped product or um you had special specifications that you wanted for your packaging you can have custom packaging made and there's um people who do that that's what they do for their living they they design and make packaging um you would, just look, up, you would just look them up on the internet and just yeah, look at the just Google them. And really, when you're first starting out, you really, you, I mean, unless you have somebody who's financing you or you have a lot of um, funds available to start your business, which I don't think most entrepreneurs, most entrepreneurs are bootstrapping it. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to get the most expensive packaging. I, you want it to look nice and appealing, but you really you don't want to go crazy okay okay so now what is the next step what would you say I mean, we've gone through the manufacturing kind of distribution retail wholesale packaging what are we forgetting okay so once you have your product it's packaged and you have all your numbers straight you know what you're going to sell to each category um you know who you're going to sell to so that's another thing so who you're going to sell to well you think well i made a product for nurses so i'm going to sell to nurses but it's really much more defined than that you have to look at your market like there's nurses there are so many different kinds of nurses nurses doing all kinds of things so you're really not just selling to nurses you're maybe selling to hospital nurses or student nurses or er nurses or maybe your your market is psych nurses mm -hmm. so you really, nurses yeah, yeah you have to narrow down to to the um to your market and and so nurses would be the category but then you have the subcategory of nurses and the reason you do that is because you don't want to waste your marketing time and and um funds marketing to the wrong group of people so that's a very important step to really um, narrow that down. And 
I mean, you have a general idea when you make a product who your market is and wh which type of uh, profession is going to use it. But you can get online and you can ask people and do surveys and that kind of thing. But um, so you, you need a place to sell it. So once you have all your manufacturing in place and you have your product and you're ready to go, you need a website um, or a retail store. Uh, I mean, these days I think it's mostly, most, most businesses are web-based. And you know, that, that's a whole new learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, setting up a website. Yeah, yeah, so some people are very tech savvy mm -hmm. and they understand you know, how to build a website and how things work and that's great they could build their own website uh, there's different website companies that will will help you build a website you can find you have to decide you know what what kind of i'll give you an example when i first started i didn't know anything about websites I, I didn't know that, that there was different types of websites. I, I, I didn't even really know what a website was. <laughs> and so somebody gave me the name of somebody who would um, create a website for me. And I told him that I wanted an e-commerce site. So he created me a site. And as I, st I, it just, my site wasn't working like the other sites I was seeing on the internet. Like, you know, it wasn't um, dynamic. It wasn't changing. I was having trouble like with the shopping cart and all kinds of problems. And it, it was affecting my business because if you don't have the right website, your business isn't going to, you need the, you need a good website. And eventually I learned that the reason that my website wasn't working and why I was having so many problems was because he put my e-commerce site on a blog site oh. and attached a shopping cart to it. So I didn't have all the functions that I needed to have a store, you know, to, to have sales and to, you know, have advertisements and the different things that a store will need. So that really, I mean, set me back for a really long time because I didn't know what to ask for. And when I tried to express to this person what I wanted, he kept telling me that it was impossible. I knew it wasn't impossible because I was seeing it elsewhere, but I didn't have the vocabulary or the knowledge to, to, to get what I wanted. Um, so that was really just something that I had to learn on the way. I, it was just, you know, as I went, I learned and talk to people and I learned through networking um, the nerdy nurse Brittany Wilson who yeah. you interviewed, she helped me a lot um, with understanding how websites work and that sort of thing um, so it's really important that you get a working website that does what you want it to do yeah and, yeah <clears throat> I, um, that was one of my biggest headaches I think yeah, it can it can be a challenge. I've um, yeah, I totally built my own website, and I'm not a um, website expert or anything. But there is definitely a learning curve, and yeah. uh, you know, you just you, you know, you either learn it on your own or you go and you pay somebody to do it. But like you said, you really have to be careful. I mean, it sounds like maybe this guy didn't really quite know you know what he was doing. So it is helpful to to seek out some help for those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what about, what about Amazon? Do you have your products on Amazon? And how does that work if you do? Well, I, um, I did have an Amazon store when I first started out. And for me, I, I, um, Amazon, you know, it's, it's great, but it just, it was, um, just it wasn't a good fit for me. So my product is on Amazon, but it's um, put there by a wholesaler that I, by a retail customer that I have who buys in bulk and sells through Amazon. So I prefer, I made a deal with him that I would not compete with him on Amazon, which um, works for me. Um, but I do sell on eBay. I, um, I like the eBay platform. I think it's easier to use and, um, their um, pricing um, 
is more clear to me than Amazon was. Um, I also sell on Etsy and I can sell on Etsy because this is a product that I make myself. I manufacture it myself. It's my product. And I think that sometimes somebody who's just starting out, these um, platforms are really great. They can have an Amazon store and they can focus on that or an eBay store. And, you know, sometimes those platforms are, it's a little easier to get traffic because they're already established platforms. Right, right. Whereas if you're just selling like from your own website, people need to know about your website. Well, for them to know about your website, you have to be either really doggone good at SEO or, you, you know, you've got to advertise, you know, and spend yes. dollars for advertising. But yeah, I agree that Amazon and Etsy and eBay, those are really great starting points because for a very, for a low cost, you can get your product out there and you can find out really if it's, if there's a demand for it or what yeah. the demand is. You can also find out who's buying your product. Yes. You know? Yeah, and they're also great platforms because they have advertising opportunities for you. And if you are just learning and just starting out and trying to, you know, maneuver how to advertise and advertising itself, it's complicated because you have to know about keywords and all these other things. And the um, Amazon and eBay and even Etsy platforms, they have... Um, templates that you can use for your advertising and they guide you right through the whole process and, and they make it easy and it's very effective. What, what about like licensing? Do you have to do licensing or? Yes. What's so, so what's um, that all about? We didn't even talk about patents. Oh gosh. Yeah. Let's talk about patents and licensing. Yeah. So it's, um, it's important that you get a patent for your invention because then it's yours and no one can, no one else can make it and um and and sell it um and if they do you have you know the legal right to sue them and and make them stop um sometimes you have a product sometimes you create a product that is not that you can't get a patent for that product um but it, that does not necessarily mean that you still can't make it and sell it um and you know that would be something you would have to discuss with an attorney um just just to protect yourself to make okay, sure okay. All right. So you so you need to go visit a patent attorney. Yes, visit a patent attorney. Um, some people will file a patent themselves, but again, those are people who are very who have an understanding of what they're doing. You can go on the United States Patent and Trademark website and um, learn about patents on that site. And I think the best route is to go to an attorney and have an attorney work with you and help you um, file your patent and get, a, get all your ducks in a row. Okay. Um, another opportunity um, for people pursuing a patent is sometimes if they have a state college in their area that has a law clinic who works in intellectual property, you can send your product over to a student who can do all the pre-patent work for you, and that can save you a lot of money. Wow, good idea. I never, I never would have thought of that. Uh, you can actually do that with anything, like a business plan or, or all, all sorts of things. Yeah, or, or you can do it like to go get your hair cut or get a massage or something yeah, like that. Yeah, too. You, <laughs> you could do that. And go to the school. Go in the massage area. <laughs> Okay, so now we talked about patents. Now let's talk about licensing. What do we need? What is licensing and why do we need it? Yeah, so you need a license to do your business, to run your business, um, mostly for tax purposes. And um, each individual state would have a um, different set of rules and requirements. So what I would recommend is that somebody who's getting ready to start their business to go on their state's government page and um, look up licensing to see what they need. Um, what they would definitely need is a reseller's um, tax ID number. And so that's a number that will, um, that will be issued to you. It's kind of like a social security number, but it it's, um, gives you the right to buy products wholesale. So if you want, so I have, um, besides selling the nurse invented products on my website, I also sell some stethoscopes and other essential things that a nurse might need. 
And in order for me to buy those products so that I can sell them, I need to provide my reseller's licensing number. Um, so that's a very important number to have. Um, and also it helps you get, um, you know, discounts when you're buying um, packaging, you know, we we're talking about packaging and right. different things that you need for your business. Um, so that's a necessity. And usually it's just like a, a, a state license, that a license to um, a business um, certificate. And it's not that, you know, each state, I would imagine it would cost different. I think it cost me like 225 a year and that's it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's a uh, that's your business license. Now, do you need to license your product? No. Or is that like a copyright? Or what is that? So you don't. Or need is to it just protected by your tr a trademark or uh, what? So the um, patent would protect your product, and I, I guess that would be your product's license, your patent. Okay. So what you want to um, trademark and copyright. So that would be your logos and the name of your company and that type of thing, like the, um, the printed material. Okay, so how, where does somebody go to get those copyrights? The same place, the United States Patent and, and Trademark. Dot com. Okay, so you And also, again, I would, I would just have an attorney or somebody um, with the logo trademark. You could probably go somewhere like Legal Zoom and have them do it for you. Right. But you know what? It sounds to me like really in the long run, it's probably just easier just to let the attorney do it. Yeah. They, yeah. Can do, they can do something in 15 minutes that it would take us hours and hours yes. and days to do. And it saves you a lot of hassle. Just, just go to the attorney. Yeah. Just let the attorneys do it. Okay. Now, and I think maybe this is my last question. Um, and that is insurance. Do you need some kind of insurance for a physical product? Um, yeah, it's a good idea um, to protect yourself. And you could get liability insurance um, through any, most insurance companies. That's, um, so that's an insurance policy in case anybody gets, in case a user of your product gets hurt use yeah. in, during the use of your product. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, there's all, you know, pretty much um, the liability insurance would be the most, most important. Uh, I would talk to the insurance agent or the insurance company that you're working with and your attorney to um, figure out, you know, you might have a more complex product that, um, you know, they're like with my product, I don't really need to carry that much insurance on it. But, you know, if you develop a product, maybe you're putting up something on your skin or, or using it as a treatment um, right. for a patient, you might need to carry more insurance. Right, exactly. And I mean, I'm just thinking, it's going through my head, you know, doing neonates. Oh my gosh, you know, you better be, you better have some good product liability there. Yeah, I'd get lots of insurance for that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Protect yourself. Okay, is, now is there anything that we've forgotten in that whole process? Um, let's see. So we did, um, you know, you, you get, you um, figure out what you, your product is. You manufacture your product. You figure out your market. You set up your website. And then you start marketing. Social media. Social media. Of course. So you would need to set up an account, a social media account for, for that product. Is it best to do it, do you think, under your product name or under your company's name? I guess maybe your company's name because you could, as a company, start producing different products. Yeah, so I, um, I did it under my company name. And I have a Facebook page both for my company name and then a separate page for the um, Koala Clip stethoscope holder. Okay. And, uh, you know, you want to have multiple social media accounts on Instagram and Twitter and what works for one person might not work for another person. Um, right. So you want to have all these accounts and there's scheduling tools that you can use. So right. you're not constantly on the online posting and 
um, you know, spending your day on, on social media all day. Right, right. Yeah, because that's, that's a time suck right yes. there. Yes. Okay, now let me ask you too. Now, are there any kind of networking groups or associations that a nurse that is producing a um, physical product that would want to join? Well, I have a networking group on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called the Nurses Club for Business. And it's actually a group where nurses at all levels of business development can um, join together and network with each other. And um, I have everyone from people who are thinking about starting an, their own business to people who have been in business for years. Um, and the businesses range from physical products to um, allied nursing schools. All, and what the way that I like the group to um, run is to have each other, you know, it's like a group where we can mentor each other. So if you are thinking about developing a product and you have a specific question, you can go in the group and ask the question. And then another member who has experience in that area can answer your question and, and help you along. Okay. Um, we also post like different resources and things like that. Another great group is the nurses, um, the National Nurses and Business Association, which is fantastic for um, new and seasoned nurse entrepreneurs. They're very supportive and they have all kinds of resources. Okay, and now can you tell us again, what was the name of your group? The Nurses Club for Business. The Nurses Club for Business. So if somebody went to Nurseborn Products uh, or nurseborn.com, They'd be able to find that. Um, you know, they, they would bet, find it um, if they went on Facebook and just um, put it in the search bar. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, all right, any tips or tools of the trade you have to recommend? Um, hmm. That's okay if you don't. Lots of tips and tools, okay. and I'm just drawing a blank right now. And <laughs> what I want to say is, it just don't believe in yourself. Not everyone's going to believe in what you're doing, and that's okay. They don't have to. As if you believe in yourself and you believe what you're doing, um, that that's what you need to be successful in business. If you have the passion behind what you're doing, it doesn't matter. Um, people don't understand. And it's, they just, they, they can't understand. And sometimes they don't understand what you're doing and that's okay. Just mm -hmm. keep doing it. Right. Because you have a vision. You have yes. a vision. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, um, I, you know, I think that's the best advice I can give anyone is just, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, I mean, some, you know, maybe in rare, rare cases, people, you know, go viral overnight, but, I haven't seen that too much. You know, it's a lot of work. It is. A, yeah, it's a lot of work. It takes a long time. And, you know, the time it takes depends on, you know, what your marketing strategies are and, and you know, how, how much money you have to put into the business. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of different things that, that you have to consider. Right. Okay. Wow. <laughs> my mind is like, my, like spinning all these things that just amazing, great information. Yeah, we talked about so much. We did. We really covered a lot of ground. So I think that's, that's great. I mean, I'm really glad. So I hope it's helped, you know, nurses who are thinking about a product or have an, you know, have an idea for a product that now they know where to go, what to do and what, what path to follow. And um, I don't think I could have done it without you um, kind of, you know, leading them and showing them, you know, how it's done. Yeah, I, I hope that if there are any nurses that do have a product that, you know, they'll, they'll send me an email or, or look me up and join my various groups and connect with me. They can just go to your website for that too, right? Yeah. Nurses that have a product. That's right. Excellent. So you guys, yeah, go to, go to Sarah's website and uh, she'll help you and she's got resources and yeah, let her help you out. This is, you know, like I say, I think I probably say this in every interview this um it's like a club these nurse entrepreneurs they're everyone is so helpful and so kind and so welcoming uh it's not like some nurses you know some nurse experiences out yeah. there you know where we eat our young it's a yeah. very welcoming crowd so 
by all means, contact Sarah if you have questions, you know, about this. So Sarah, tell me what, how, how has it changed your life? How has it changed my life? Um, well, freedom, I, it's, it's wonderful to have the freedom to make my own hours, um, to schedule things, you know, when I, when, when I can and, um, just really be in charge of myself and, you know, I don't have to ask anybody, um, if I can do something or if I, um, you know, if I have an idea, I could just pursue it. I don't have to go through any um, channels of command or anything like that. Um, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. It's so liberating. It is. It is. I mean, one thing you have to do when you start work, because I work from home. My office is in my home and my living, I have sacrificed my living room, which is now a a warehouse and a office. <laughs> um, but you really have to start to draw boundaries with families and family and friend because they're not used to you being at home and working. And they don't think you're working. You know, they don't really know what you're doing. And so they sometimes it's a little difficult for them to understand that, you know, I you, you still have deadlines. You still have to get things done when you are working for yourself. And sometimes you, you have to let people know that, you know, I can't talk right now because I have work to do. Because I'm working. Yeah. What would you say, what would you say then to somebody, to a nurse who, who isn't able to work, you know, their clinical nursing job anymore? Um, or even if it's not clinical, if it's just in a, a healthcare organization, maybe they're a nurse educator, or, you know, a case manager, something else like that. What would you say, you know, to somebody who, for because maybe they've had an injury or an illness or something, the difference between working that job, whether like in the hospital or a different organization, and now be, being a nurse entrepreneur and being able to work from home, what would you say to them? Um, you know, you mentioned somebody who has an illness, so that um, that's close to my heart because I have a chronic illness, um, and it's been the best thing for me. Um, it has reduced my stress because if I don't feel well, I am not feeling stressed out about calling in and saying, I can't come to work again today because I don't feel well, and I can make adjust my own schedule to meet my own needs. Um, People with children, I have, um, my daughter is in high school, my, my son is in, in college now, but my daughter doesn't drive yet, so I need to cart her around to various activities. I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can go to um, sporting events with them, and um, I can, I feel like I'm more involved in what they're doing. And um now, where, what was I saying? <laughs> that was it. You just said it. You just said it all, Sarah. Okay. You know what? I think, uh, you know, unless there's anything else that you want to add, I, I just want to wrap up and, and say thank you so much uh, because I know that there are nurses that, who just benefited from our time with you in learning, you know, how to bring a product to market. It's not, they don't teach us that in nursing school. Yeah, no, no, they don't. <laughs> So now I, I hope I was of, of help and I hope that um, I hope that I hear, hear some emails that people are thinking about developing their own product because, you know, nurses are really creative and innovative and. Yep, they are creative and innovative creatures, are we? Yes. Okay, well then this, so I, I just want to thank you again for joining us and, uh, you know, just giving us this opportunity to sit with you and pick your brain and stuff. So, um, you know, if you have any questions, again, I would just send you right over to Sarah at her website at nurseborn.com. And this is Christy Hendricks with changeofshift.com, or I'm sorry, changeofshift.org, changeofshift.org, uh, saying, uh, you know, take care and to your success. All right. Bye-bye.